morning. As Jessup mentioned, um, I have a PhD in neuroscience, which means that I study how the brain works. I study the central nervous system. However, being a scientist actually wasn't my first career plan. I had every intention of becoming an artist. And um, though these two career paths seem to be polar opposite, um, this transition from scientist to artist didn't happen overnight. It actually happened over years, and it started with this very moment. Following 9-11, my brother, who was in the Army, deployed, the first of many deployments over a decade. I'm very grateful to say that he returned from each deployment, by all definitions, physically unharmed. We're very fortunate for that. However, his mental health was a different story. Well, over time with each deployment, he stopped smiling in photographs. He stopped laughing. He became easily agitated and had increasingly severe night terrors and panic attacks. These are all symptoms that we associate easily today with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. However, having a label wasn't sufficient. It didn't tell me how trauma changed my brother or how to help him heal. In my search for answers, I actually found a field of neuroscience, where I learned that biology regulates behavior, not magic. Um, and I was just so in awe of this field and the potential for it to give us answers. And I was so eager to help promote and advance research on post-traumatic stress disorder that I decided to go from art to science. I actually pursued a PhD in neuroscience to specifically study um, stress-related mental illnesses like depression and anxiety disorders. And over the course of my education, my brother and I talked, as siblings do, we would discuss what was going on in my life, so I would talk about my research. And as my brother felt up to it, or as he could, he would discuss his experiences with post-traumatic stress disorder. And interestingly, over this time, um, these experiences really gave me a lot of unique insight to what I was studying and became very impactful to me. So at the end of my education, I thanked my brother for being my main source of motivation over the years. And to my surprise, he thanked me for my motivation because, come to find out, it helped save his life. You see, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, with our talks that we had about my, my research, my brother came to view mental illness as just that. It's an illness with a biological cause, not a character defect. With that, too, he, stay, he came to view post-traumatic stress disorder as his brain's attempt to adapt to a traumatic event, and that this change in function wasn't fixed. It could be reprogrammed. So come to, come to the end of it, I learned that educating my brother about the biology of stress and mental health had an incredible, unintended secondary effect. It empowered him. Likewise, my goal today is to educate you guys on stress and mental health in hopes to empower you too when it comes to mental health. So here we go. Let's talk about our love-hate relationship with stress. We can all laugh at this photo because we've all been there. We've all been stressed out. Stress is any threat to our well-being. When our brains perceive stress, it triggers a cascade of hormones throughout our bodies that help to increase our heart rate, that help to increase our glucose levels, our muscle function, our attention, all to ultimately give us the focus and the energy needed to overcome a challenge. So despite what you may think, stress is actually fundamentally a good thing. It helps us to um, meet the challenges at hand, to survive and to adapt. However, of course, <laughs> there is a catch when it comes to stress when it, with us humans. We think about stress a lot. We obsess about stress. And as neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky discusses in his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, this ability to think stress creates a unique challenge for us humans, let's say. So for instance, zebras um, and other animals they have the same stress response as we do, but they only activate this system when they're faced with an immediate threat. So in the case of a zebra, like running from a lion. Once they've escaped the lion, this stress response is turned off. Their stress response goes back to baseline. They're like, you know, end of story, it's completely over. They go back to grazing in the fields, and they're blissful, end of story, right? What lion? Humans, on the other hand, we escape a threat, and then we proceed to think about that stressful event over and over in our minds. 
We go on to worry endlessly about the should-haves, I could-haves, I would-haves, if onlys. And, and if those two things don't get to us, then we also do this thing where we think about endless scenarios in which, um, you know, worst case scenarios in which we just think and think and think about all these endless terrible things that could happen, and the majority of the time they don't. So though this ability to think stress can be good for us at times, it can help us to um, anticipate danger, this is the dilemma we face. Regardless if you are attending to a stress out here, like running from a lion, or attending to a stress in here, like worry over relationships or finances and your work, the same stress response is activated, okay? So what this means is that our ability to think stress can actually put us at risk of living in a chronic state of survival, right? Even in the face, or even in the absence, excuse me, of a, an immediate danger. And more importantly, this chronic state of survival comes with elevated levels of stress hormones, which over time can actually induce wear and tear on our bodies and compromise the very core of who we are, our brains. Studies have shown that chronic stress can actually change the shape of our neurons in our brain. These are the cells in our brains. For instance, in the prefrontal cortex, which is labeled here in orange, and in the hippocampus, which is labeled here in blue, chronic stress causes neurons to shrink. They actually lose branches in these brain, in these brain regions. Um, in addition to that, other brain regions, oh, sorry, as you can see here, I have a nice little example for you. You can see here these uh, two tracings from rat brains. On the left, you have no stress, and on the right, you have chronic stress. You can actually see there are less branches on the cell. Now, in other brain regions, for instance, like the amygdala, which is here in purple, um, you have the opposite effect. Neurons in that brain region under chronic stress actually sprout. They get more branches. Now, I know what you're thinking. You crazy lady, I'm not a rat. Why do I care about this? Um, well, come to find out, humans who are um, suffering from stress-related mental illnesses like depression and anxiety disorders show the same types of changes in neuron shape in their brain. And what this tells us is that our neurons in our brain are also susceptible to the detrimental effects of chronic stress. So if the next question in your mind then is, okay, I'll buy into that. Why does the shape of a neuron matter? Well, what we have found is this. The fewer branches a neuron has, the less a neuron talks to other neurons. And the more branches that a neuron has, the more it talks to other neurons. So the changes that chronic stress induce in how our neurons are shaped actually affects how our cells talk to each other, and consequently, the overall activity that we have in our brain. So for instance, um, clinical studies have shown that uh, a loss of neuron branches in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus is actually associated with decreased activity in these brain regions in depressed patients. So you can see here in this imaging study that I have of the prefrontal cortex, Less red in this part of your brain means less activity, okay? Um, I should note, though, that healthy individuals who are exposed to chronic stress show similar changes in brain activity. So what this tells us is that we are all susceptible, we are all vulnerable to the detrimental effects of chronic stress and its impact on our mental health, okay? Um, with that, though, um, how we see how these changes in brain function affect us and make us vulnerable is how it, it impacts our behavior. Specifically, um, the hippocampus regulates your memory and learning functions of your brain. And the prefrontal cortex regulates your problem solving. So when chronic stress impairs activities in these brain regions, we have a harder time learning new information, coming up with solutions, and adapting our behavior. Likewise, these two brain regions also inhibit the amygdala, which is your fear center, and they help to regulate your stress response. So when activity, again, is compromised in these brain regions under chronic stress, um, our abilities to regulate our emotions and to keep our stress hormones at bay is also hindered. So with that, um, what ends up happening, this starts starting, sounding like a, a dog chasing its tail, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, when we have these changes in brain function, um, you can see how we end up having more thoughts of stressful events, and when we have these more thoughts of stressful events, 
we end up strengthening these stress pathways in our brains. And when we strengthen these path, uh, stress pathways in our brains, um, we are at risk of being stuck in this negative thinking cycle. We start to believe that you know losing is the rule. So um, if there can be any good news out of this, <laughs> what we have what we can say here, at least, is that the negative feelings that we have with um, stress and when we're under chronic stress is not all in our brains figuratively. It's all in our brains literally. And I don't say this to make light of mental health, but rather to emphasize that we are biological beings, right? So simply understanding that the feelings that we have have a physical realm, a physical place, can in and of itself help bring sanity to the insanity and uncertainty that we can feel with life. It's nice to know that it's just not being made up, right? But what now? I mean, just knowing that stress is happening and this is how it happens biologically, it doesn't help us in moving forward and coping with stress. Um, you know, the last thing I really want to have happen is for you to start stressing about being stressed and be running around saying, oh, what a world, what a world, my neurons are shrinking, it's the end, you know? It's not necessary to do that because it's not all bad news when it comes to chronic stress. Thanks to a process in our brains called neuroplasticity, our neurons are actually able to recover. They're able to bounce back if we manage our stress, if we take steps to do that. Neuroplasticity is the way in which your brain learns and adapts throughout your life. Every new thing that you do, every new thought that you have, every new task that you come about actually causes your neurons to create new branches and new connections in your brain. And the more that we practice these new connections and these new pathways, the stronger they become. So it was like I showed you earlier with our, our stress pathway, right? This, this whole principle of neuroplasticity can apply to how you learn to ride a bike, how you learn to walk when you are young, to how we manage stress. So I showed you the stress pathway earlier, and I showed you that the more we stress, the more we practice this stress pathway, and the stronger it becomes. But the inverse of that is actually also true. The less we uh, practice that pathway, the more we manage our stress, the weaker that pathway will become. So in a lot of ways, the pathways in our brains are like exercising a muscle. You go to the gym, you're working out a muscle, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. The less you work out that muscle, the weaker it becomes, right? So with that, I'm gonna pull up our stress circuit again, but this time we have a new element. This new element is you. You are here in your stress pathway, right? We can't control when stress happens to us. We don't have an ability to see into a you know, glass ball and predict the future. However, what we can do is have a choice in how we respond to stress. Extensive studies have shown that simple activities like getting adequate sleep, your diet, moderate exercise, not a lot of exercise, moderate exercise, um, taking a walk every day, and socializing are all things that can help us to reduce stress, help us to strengthen our neurons, help us to improve the activity of brain regions that were compromised by chronic stress, and ultimately to practice pathways that help to promote mental health. So with that, um, you should also keep in mind, though, that these are activities you can do physically, but how we think about stress, the discipline that we have with our thinking is also vitally important to promoting positive biases in our life. So that can take many different sizes and shapes. Everybody practices mindfulness di differently. For my brother, this step for him was learning how to pause between, before making any types of decisions or responses. This ability to stop before he responds to something helps to bring him back into place, back into his body, helps him to be present with his feelings, and is the difference of having rational or irrational thinking. For me, in my own practice, I um, like to play this little game called favorite part of your day. My husband's smiling because he's like, yes, I have to do this too. <laughs> um, um, it's a game actually that I learned from a three-year-old in which everybody at the dinner table goes around and identifies what, or talks about the favorite part of their day. Now this is such a small and simple little quick thing that we do on a daily basis now. However, what it does for me is a couple of things. First of all, it helps me to connect with people who, who love me. Second thing it does is that it helps me to focus on, on what went right in my day instead of what went wrong. 
And the third thing it does is that it helps me wake up the next morning from a place of gratitude instead of fear and sadness. So these simple acts, they don't have to be massive things, right? They can be little exercises or big exercises, however you choose to go about it. And I can tell you, though, that even with this simple practice or with big practices like working out and exercising, um, I still have stress. I will be the first to admit that I still have stress. I still stress out. Even though I have studied stress for 10 years, I am not in any way immune. Unfortunately, it's not like a radioactive spider bite. I really wish it was. Um, <laughs> but in any case, um, my, as my brother would tell you, the key to mindfulness is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Um, even though you know, these bad habits, they're hard to break, they're not impossible to break. And the more that we have mindfulness and repetition, the more we can start shifting from a negativity bias to a positivity bias. So no matter how you choose to think about stress or go about managing stress in your life, I hope you remember one thing. Who you are today on a biological level is changing. It's ever changing. You today are your uniquest you. Yesterday, you had different connections in your brain. Tomorrow, you'll have different connections in your brain. Today, you are you, your nakiest you, and you have infinite potential for change. I encourage you to use this potential, this power, to the best of your ability. And to you all, may the force be with you. <laughs> Thank you.